Take your time. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here. I want to thank Damon and also President Lena Anderson and all of you for having me here tonight. I was sitting listening to your reports um, about the battles that are going on so that black people can move into communities, so that we can integrate America, which is probably um, as segregated as it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, thinking about um, how so many battles have still not been won, and very concerned about um, that both as an independent, a citizen, an African American, and all the other things that I am. I um, wanted the other thing that I've been, I was thinking about when you were talking is that um, my mayor, who's a liberal, who just got elected for his first term, I don't think he's been there longer than one term, this is de Blasio, um, he got less than 10% of the vote, mm. um, and it's not clear that he deserved that. And he just recently announced, actually in the newspaper this morning, which this has been sort of building up, the um, New York Housing NYCHA Authority in uh, New York has been more and more encroaching on the um, housing project. And so he's come up with what he thinks is a brilliant idea, which is really a scam, to build on the projects, um, in front of the projects, like where people sit in benches, where the kids sometimes play if there is a basketball court or something. He's going to build affordable housing for white people, even though he doesn't say that. But that's who is their it's getting built for. And of course, this isn't going to impact, this supposedly is going to help NYCHA, <laughs> and it's not going to impact the people who are there. And bit by bit over the last number of years, um, the housing project and other people have been getting black people from the housing projects to move to places like Buffalo, um, and I think Syracuse, yes where I assume they're um, sending black poor people. And people go up there, and not only are there no jobs, little housing, but it also it tremendously impacts on the community or the lack thereof, because many people have lived in these housing arenas for many years, and um, they're just being dumped. There are no black people in Harlem, maybe five, <laughs> <laughs> and you have to hurry up and go count. Um, it's an outrage. And unfortunately, the people who run our city um, have not intervened on this. You can't just do what you want to do if you're a contractor, if, unless you have the permission and support of the political apparatus, the elected politicians, most of whom in New York City are Democrats, there are some Republicans, um, you wouldn't be able to do this. And the takeover of Harlem started like 15 years ago. So this stuff is very, very upsetting. But what's most upsetting about it is that our community, I think, is stunned by it. And they don't quite know what to do. The homeless shelters are overflowing. I, when I went to Harlem um, a couple of weeks ago, people were saying to me, Dr. Falani, there's nobody up here to help me, and this is where I sleep on the floor, on the ground outside. So the issue is how much do we care about this stuff? We talk about it a lot. Um, some of us talk about it a lot. Some people don't talk about it at all. But it seems that if we care about it, we have to do something about it, because to me that's what caring is all about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we have done that. <laughs> I think we're failing. If you all are up here talking about trying to integrate communities and we're being run out of them downstate or wherever, that's a big deal. So I wanted to um, 
talk a little bit about what it is that we're planning to do. Um, Dr. King, in April of the year that he was murdered, in 1968, he did, said two things. Well, he was planning one. One is that he called on poor people to come to Washington and camp out to do Tent City. That's what it ended up being called, even though he died, was assassinated before it happened. Because he wanted to put on display the poor people of America. And he wanted blacks, Latinos, white, Native Americans, Asians all to gather. And he wanted to shame this government in the same way that he had shamed them with the international coverage of sh showing displays of um, dogs fighting people in the South when we were fighting for civil rights. And I also think he was deeply concerned because given that black people had civil rights, we didn't have economic stability. And I think he wanted very much to make sure that our poverty and issues of poverty didn't get turned against us, which they have. Because according to the people who talk about poverty, who talk about our problems, we're poor because we're shiftless, because we don't like to go to work, even though we built the country, um, all these kinds of things. And the terror of that is not that people who are simply um, races or whatever, classes, it's not only that they believe that, but the problem is that the poor people believe that. Mm -hmm. We believe if we come out of poverty, if we are in poverty, that we did it to ourselves. So Dr. King was murdered before Tent City and nobody else could really pull it off even though it happened. I was 18 and went to see it with my older sister and it had a tremendous impact on me. The other thing that he did, he wrote, um, Where Do We Go From Here? Mm -hmm. And in that book, he said that it was very important that the African American community be connected to the mainstream of America. Because we live then separate from, and we still do. And he knew that that was critical to our growth and the country's growth. And we are nowhere near the mainstream of America. Actually, um, most of us live in outer places. <laughs> Many of the people who live in housing developments and in communities around the country and, and in New York, they live in a 20 block radius. They don't leave their homes. They don't leave their communities. Number one, it costs money. Number two, if you're not brought into the mainstream, you don't quite know what to do if you live in Brooklyn and you end up on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And so all of that has to be addressed and something has to be done about it because that's what's going to make a difference in this country. So I think in order to deal with the kinds of issues that we're talking about in this meeting and that some people are talking about around the country, we have to do two things. We have to focus in two ways. One is that we have to focus on fighting for more democracy because we don't have it. That's why I'm an independent. I think we should dump all the parties in the garbage can and have and people go register to vote and not give the kind of clout and location to political parties. And that goes for independent parties. I'm one, I helped to build one in New York that's so corrupt. Mm. Um, that's a whole other story, and I'd be <laughs> glad to talk about it. But anyway, because I think parties are corrosive. Mm. And you don't need parties. You basically need to be a registered voter or to be born. Some places in the world, by the time you're 18, you don't even have to register. You automatically have the right to vote. Mm. So putting all these things in place to keep people from voting actually is an exercise in disempowerment. And this is America. <laughs> it's supposed to be the home of the free and the land of the brave, but it violates in so many ways
people's right of passage, people's rights of participation. And I think Dr. King was thinking that a lot of the um, people who fought, not just regular ordinary people, but a lot of the leadership was going to take us somewhere. And in fact, what happened is many got elected to office and they've taken us nowhere. But we have to, as regular ordinary people, do something about that. So I grew up poor. My family is still poor. I'm from Chester, Pennsylvania. It's a slum of Philadelphia. Um, I came of age in the 60s. I was the youngest in my family, which helped a lot. There was an eight-year difference. So whatever my family had, I got. And I also grew up, obviously, when um, the Civil Rights Movement was going on, so it was possible to go to college. Um, I thought that my nieces and nephews were going to follow, and my cousins, and then the 1970s really hit. And they weren't able to come along for a host of reasons, mostly poverty and devastation. I went to college. I was the first person to go. I went because there was so much pain and upsetness in my family. My grandfather was a piece of work. <laughs> he would go to work on Mondays. He would work from Mondays to Friday. He came home on Fridays. He started drinking. He drank all day Friday after work, all day Saturday. He would cuss people out and be not nice. He'd get up on Sunday and he went to church. <laughs> and then he'd go back to work on Monday and he would do it over and over and over again. It was like a terror. But I realized that my grandfather was born in 1894. So his parents or grandparents were slaves. And I think a lot about, and I wish I had known that you could ask questions, I didn't even know history. What, what do you do with all of that? Where does that live? How does it express itself? All of the men in my family were basic alcoholics, and most of them worked, and they were, some of them were my favorite people in the world. But there was a lot of chaos and crises people dying, getting sick. And one thing that I realized as a kid is that people didn't talk about it. Nobody ever said, life is hard, like this is like craziness. People just lived it. And it was clear to me that people didn't know black people, that that was something that you could talk about or that you should talk about. So I decided I was going to go to college. I was going to become a psychologist, and then I was going to go back to Chester and save my family and friends. Um, many of them were destroyed before I reached the end of college. And I realized that it wasn't just my family and friends, that there was a lot of stuff going wrong with America. So I went looking for people who were doing things who were dealing with poverty and the impact of it, talking about it, um, not covering it over, and dealing with all the subjective issues of what it means to grow up black and poor in the richest country in the world. And I took my first psychology course, and I didn't know the people they were talking about. So I decided I would get every degree that I could possibly get because I wanted to be the doctor for the people. But I wouldn't learn any of it, only enough to pass tests. And I went looking for people who were doing things outside of the box, and I met a Jewish man who was a progressive, and his name was Dr. Fred Newman. He's as controversial as I am. We love each other. Unfortunately, he died in 2011. But we started working together, and he was the first person that I had a conversation with where he didn't poo-poo poverty. He actually taught me more about poverty. And there was a grouping of us that was, at some point, 200, 300 people, who decided that we wanted to see if you could create things outside of traditional barriers that dealt with things like mental illness, that dealt with racism, that dealt with political power, 
that dealt with all these kinds of things that were not controlled by the government and you weren't dependent on them and they didn't go the regular way. I have a niece who's 59. She had a breakdown because her sister died unexpectedly at a poor hospital at 14. Terry went out on the streets and started preaching and whatever. She was in grief, but we didn't know, we didn't have a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And she's been in and out of that system for years. My nephews have been in every kind of problem that you could come up with. But this, this isn't personal failure, it's systemic failure. Mm -hmm. The violence in our communities <coughs> ain't personal. <laughs> it's not like black people have a gene for madness. Um, the world is mad, and a lot of what we still have to contend with is madness. So two of the things that I've done, one is um, Newman and I co-founded youth programs. We were working with um, welfare recipients who were trying to get justice at welfare centers because people treated them like crap. And at some point, the parents asked us if we would create after-school programs for their kids. And we met with the kids, asked them what they wanted to do, and they said, well, they wanted to do talent shows. Yeah. So, were you in a talent show? One of the judges all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we um, said, okay. We didn't say, don't you want to read a book? And we built this phenomenal program called the All Stars Project. The talent shows have gone on for 30 years. The kids run them, they sell the tickets, they're responsible for the audience. We don't do booing. I tell them they could not shoot me or each other. And they were so excited to have something to do that was fun, that they ran, that they were responsible for. We've done thousands of these talent shows. We're in six cities. Um, so we just kept creating these youth programs. So we have talent shows, phenomenal. Um, for three generations, if you go into any project housing in New York, you'll find a grandmother, a mother, and a, a kid who's currently involved. At some point, the kids ask us to help them get into, um, to do better in school, basically to get a job. And so we created this other program. We went out, we don't take government money. We went out on the streets in the early 80s and we put up tables at Wall Street and also on Fifth Avenue. All, we went and found all the rich white people. And we said to them, there are young people in this country who are dying. They're suffering. They're poor. <laughs> and you should help us. And we've built a non-for-profit that's $10 million. We're in six states off of that dialogue. People took us. I was just in Ferguson St. and St. Louis last week. And one of our donors was chairman of Ernst & Young. So we both got connected to them. And as we go to different cities, the other five, we also have access to their businesses. And what we did was we ran a program, it's called the Development School for Youth, and we have the kids come in for a semester. We take them to Wall Street and other places. We show them um, you know, how to maneuver and be different places outside of their comfort zone. And then we place them in paid summer internships at $11 an hour. And their requirement is that they have to be on time they have to cover all the proper things. And when people ask them to do things, they have to say yes, even if they don't know what they're doing. So that's grown, and that's been extremely profitable. And many of these people, um, I was at the uh, Jim Turley's house in St. Louis because they want us to come to St. Louis and do some work there with our work, with our programs. And then we have a program called Youth on Stage. We have a center in on 42nd Street in Manhattan, and we also have a center in Newark. And parents were calling me and asking me what I had done to their kids and asking me to do it to them. So I created a university, which I can't call a university because I'll get in trouble by whoever is the god of universities. And <laughs> so we did it. And since 20, 2010, 6,000 people have taken classes 
at our UX is what we call it. And um, probably 75% of them are adults. And then we have tons and tons of kids. So I say all of this, first of all, I'm proud of it. We've worked our everything's off in order to provide proper after school experiences for our kids. But it's also important because of the educational failure in our communities. Every day, every week, every month, there's an article that comes out that says white middle class kids are smarter than our kids on regions. There was a report that came out last, about six months ago, that in 90 schools in New York City, not one black or Latino kid passed the region. Now, if they were my, my schools, I would, shut them, I would shut them down because if that's what's going on, it can't be the kids who are there. It has to be the institution. That's right. So one of the things that we've discovered, one of the things that we've discovered is because, excuse me, Fred grew, he was poor, he grew up in the Bronx, went to uh, fight in the Viet, you know, in the Korean War, and then he got, he used whatever you get, the, um, the to go to college, GI Bill. Yeah. Yeah. And he ended up at Stanford, where I spoke just two weeks ago. And he was brilliant, like brilliant, mm -hmm. both philosophically and intellectually, but he was a tremendous organizer, street organizer. So one of the things that we looked at was why it was that the young people weren't doing well in school. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple. It's because white kids don't have bigger brains than our kids. They have bigger lives. <laughs> mm. They go, you know, to the museums, they go out to eat, they travel the country and the world. There was an um, article a couple of years ago that said white middle class kids, by the time they're five, have had 1,500 more outside of home experiences wow. than two kids from the inner city communities. So. The problem with the learning has to do with that level and kind of exposure, which is what all of our programs are about. We take young people everywhere. We put them in unusual circumstances. And you think if we could have figured this out, that the New York City Board of Education would, mm -hmm. but they don't, they won't. It's a dysfunctional system. Everything they do is wrong. And the kids are suffering and people won't deal with that as a serious issue. They just keep putting a label on them and sending them, them off. So I'm waiting for the kids to call me up one day and tell me that they're sitting outside of Stuyvesant, which is where the rich white and not rich, but Asian young people go to. It has this swimming pool and a tennis racket or whatever court and everything. Our kids don't have books. Right. And I want them to tell me they're going to sit out there, they're going to do a sit-in until they get that kind of school. It's almost like what the kids did in a different arena in Soweto, where they come to terms and say, 